This video is sponsored by Masterworks, but more on that later on. When it comes to investing, we face a problem today that didn't exist 40 years ago. There are too many options. Are you aware that there are over 5,600 companies on the US exchange to invest in? And yet there are roughly 3,000 ETFs and 8,000 mutual funds to choose from. The question that many people would ask is, why are there so many investment funds? The main reason, sadly, is marketing and investment companies looking for more ways to make money. And if you're like me, we need to narrow down our options to pick a path for an investment strategy. But before looking at the different investment strategies, let's create a baseline for our discussion. If you invested $1,000 in gold in 1980, it would be worth $2,430 today and that same $1,000 invested in the S&P 500 would be worth $110,000. But if you invested $1,000 in Microsoft in 1986, it would be worth $3.27 million. Granted, if you invested that same amount of money in Blockbuster, you might have enough to buy yourself a popcorn at the movie. Unless you're Marty McFly, we can't invest in the past, but there are some key takeaways that can help us with our future investments. Which leads us to the main question of, what is the perfect investment strategy for the perfect portfolio? And in order for us to answer that, we need to discuss some of the more common investment strategies that are available. And I'm using the term perfect in a tongue in cheek way, but we're gonna explore the topic together. I'll start by talking about Warren Buffett's strategy, which matches up two major themes of a buy and hold strategy and a value investing strategy. Most all good financial advice starts with implementing a buy and hold strategy where the intent is to hold the investment for years or possibly decades. And if you're willing to do that, then it needs to be with high quality companies that can weather any form of storm and still be around in decades. The second part is value investing, which involves searching for stocks that are undervalued by the market and buying them at a discount. The father of value investing is considered to be Benjamin Graham, who wrote the classic investment book, The Intelligent Investor, and mentored Warren Buffett. Graham taught that investors should focus on companies with a low price to earnings ratio, high dividend yields, and a strong balance sheet. That sounds good in theory, but most investors like you and me, we don't have time to research and understand if companies are undervalued or not. When we unpack the Buffett approach, most all of us can follow the buy and the hold aspect. That part's easy. But the value investing aspect is much more difficult because the expertise that's required to fully understand a company's value and whether or not it's undervalued. So within the umbrella of Buffett, let's get a little more tactical. In a letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders, Warren Buffett directed that when he dies, the trustees are to invest his wife's inheritance into 90% stock index and 10% into short-term government bonds. Essentially, this is a two-fund portfolio that is heavily weighted in stock, which goes against the common advice from financial advisors to take 100 and subtract your age. And that number is the percent that you should have invested in stocks. So if you were 60 years old and you subtracted it from 100, you get 40. According to this philosophy, you'd have 60% bonds and 40% in stock. It's a very conservative approach. So why? Why would Buffett break away from this common advice and have such a different strategy for his own wife? To understand why, a Spanish finance professor ran a study where he looked at a baseline investment and broke it out into multiple points over 114 years to see which would do better during recessions and hard times where only 4% was withdrawn each year. Then he reviewed the results in Buffett's 90-10 split versus multiple different splits to see which had the highest rate of failure. And in this case, failure means running out of money within 30 years. And as you can see in the breakout, the highest failure rate was 30% stock and 70% bonds. And the one with the lowest rate of failure was the 60-40 split. The potential gain from stocks far outperforms a heavy-handed bond mix. And Buffett's 90-10 split for his wife had a very low rate of failure. Granted, she'll have billions of dollars and not really have anything to worry about. But for the rest of us, the main purpose in creating an investment strategy is to maximize the growth, but also have the diversity to minimize our risk. But as we all experienced in 2022, the impact from record inflation and increasing interest rates caused most investments to decline. In this situation, money managers began to change their asset allocation to include alternatives and physical assets that hold their value during market dips. In a recent Bloomberg survey of money managers representing some of the richest families, 
Their findings included a focus on diversity and safe havens, especially collectibles with the greatest allocation to art. Case in point, contemporary art has doubled the S&P 500's total return over the last 26 years. And in 2022, the art market had its strongest auction season of all time. Historically, this has been an exclusive asset class worth billions, and the art market used to be hard to get into. But with Masterworks, you can diversify your portfolio with multi-million dollar paintings. From legends like Picasso, Banksy, and Monet for just a fraction of their total value. Masterworks has built an impressive track record for their exits, with all of them being profitable. And with those kinds of results, Masterworks has seen over 700,000 investors try to gain access. But there is a wait list. And I've reached out to them to give you all priority access to their latest offerings. Just click the link in the description below. The next area to cover is index investing strategy, which involves investing in a broad market index, such as the S&P 500, rather than individual stocks. And this is why so many people invest in mutual funds and ETF. The strategy became popular by John Bogle, who happens to be the founder of the Vanguard Group. And he believed that most investors would be better off investing in low cost index funds rather than having actively managed mutual funds. These index funds seek to match the performance of an underlying index, and they have much lower fees than actively managed funds. And there are a lot of studies that suggest that index funds perform as well, if not better, than actively managed funds. But for some reason, the actively managed funds are far more popular. And I believe it's because of, well, psychologically, many of us believe that an actively managed fund is gonna have experts that can find the better deals and uncover more opportunity. Even though the results for the index funds prove that completely wrong. With regards to Bogle, his followers are referred to as Bogleheads, and that's not to be confused with bobbleheads. And some follow more of an 80-20 split where they have 50% in domestic index funds, 30% in international indexes, and 20% in bonds, making it a three-fund portfolio. But there's another sect of Bogleheads that have more of a two-fund portfolio that have a 60-40 split. And don't worry, I will provide a chart later on that lists out the fund options from Fidelity, Vanguard, and Schwab to cover the atypical three-fund portfolio so that you can have that resource available. Most all investment strategies have nearly the same themes, such as buy and hold, which is really to minimize your turnover. And you do this by investing for the medium and the long term. Next, diversify the mix of assets to reduce your risk. And you do that by having domestic and international stock along with bonds. The next point, don't try to beat the market. That's why you invest in index funds to keep up with the market, not beat it. And the last point, change your portfolio mix over time as you get older to minimize your risk once again. In leveraging those specific points within the strategies, I've talked about the Bogle Heads and Buffett where they may have had a two fund or a three fund portfolio. But there's a lot of different strategies, like the Coffee House portfolio, which was created by Bill Schulteis. And he talks about it in his book, The Coffee House Investor, where the intent is to create a strategy that is so simple that you could literally do it while sitting down and having a coffee. The strategy is a 60-40 split, but he makes it a point to have a diversified asset allocation like the one on the screen where it is more of a seven fund portfolio. Even though the coffee house portfolio is over 25 years old, it's one of the few that makes it a point to call out the inclusion of REITs to have in your portfolio. Before moving on, I have a favor to ask of you. If you like my content, I'd greatly appreciate if you consider pressing the like button so my content here on YouTube can grow. And better yet, I'd love it if you'd consider subscribing so you can be up to date with all of my latest content. Next is the Swenson portfolio from David Swenson, who happened to be the chief investment officer at Yale University Endowment. His strategy is a 50-30-20 split, where 50% is stock, 30% are bonds, and 20% are real estate in the form of REITs. One of the major drawbacks from this strategy was that during the 2007 recession, this portfolio had about a 40% drop due to the heavy investment in real estate. But like all other strategies, it has a focus of diversification and holding the asset over time. And I'll show later on that most all of these strategies perform similarly over time. There are a ton of different strategies out there, but there's only one more strategy that I wanna to cover today, and that happens to be the permanent portfolio, where its sole purpose is to provide steady returns with very low volatility over the long term. An investment analyst named Harry Brown came up with a strategy in the early 1980s. It consists of 25% stocks, 25% bonds, 25% cash in the form of treasury bills, and 25% gold. It is a very stable strategy, but it doesn't grow as much as the more common 60-40 split. If you're anything like me, your head is spinning with all of these different strategy options. So when it comes down to it, which one is best? Well, there's only one thing left for me to do. I need to compare them all at once. 
For the comparison, I'll look at each investment strategy since 1990, and I'll start with a permanent portfolio strategy which had an average return of 7.4%. Next is the Swenson portfolio, which had an annual return of 8.5%. I'll follow that up with a coffeehouse strategy that also comes in at 8.5% since 1990. And during the same time period, the S&P 500 had an average annual return of 9.9%. And not to be outdone, Microsoft has had an average return of 19.4% during that same time period. Now, I am not trying to condone investing in a single stock like Microsoft, but I just wanted it out there as a comparison. Investing in a single stock? Well, that's more like gambling than it is investing. Like I had stated earlier, if you had only invested in Blockbuster, you'd be broke. But what I am saying is that investing can be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be. Yes, all of those strategies underperformed the S&P 500 on average, and they required a lot more work. But due to the diversification, they do weather the hard times much better than the S&P 500. With that in mind, an item that we need to consider is that the market has a correction of about negative 10% on average every 1.2 years. And since World War II, we've had a recession on average about every five years. And it takes the stock market roughly 27 months to recover from those losses. And I think that this one point is one of the most important. Because wherever you're at with your investments, you need to ask yourself if you can afford to lose 27 months of your investments to a recession. Next, I'm going to walk through how I'm going to approach my investment strategy over time. For the most part, I'm going to be taking Buffett's stance with a 90% stock and 10% in fixed income assets. Not necessarily just in bonds, but in items like treasuries, bonds, CDs, etc. For my portion of stock, I'll have them across several index funds and a few individual companies that are domestic. In addition to that, I'm gonna have a small percentage that are in international stock indexes. The line between domestic and international is completely different today than it was 30 years ago when most of these strategies came about. Some could argue that stock like Apple and Microsoft aren't simply domestic since they generate so much of their value overseas. But with some dedicated investments internationally, the intent is that if the US is in a recession, then the foreign markets hopefully aren't. For context, since World War II, we've had five global recessions, but in that same time frame, we've had 12 recessions within the US, which is roughly a 42% chance of an overlap. And that's the power of having dedicated international stock within your portfolio. A point that I didn't cover earlier is there's an underlying issue with locking yourself into a dedicated split of let's say 60% stock, 20% real estate, and 20% bonds. Because in following that structure to a T, you need to rebalance your portfolio once a year to keep those balances. If you happen to rebalance within a tax advantage account like an IRA, then it's really no big deal. But if it isn't in an IRA, then you'll be paying capital gains tax on rebalancing and then you're gonna be losing on some of your investment. Instead, I'm keeping with the approach of investing on the front end with the mix of a 90-10, but I'm only gonna rebalance it in my tax advantage account as needed. While working at Amazon, they teach you a concept to always work backwards to solve a problem. And for me, the problem to solve is how do my investments survive a recession where it's gonna take an average of 27 months for the market to recover. So in simple terms, I want my fixed income assets to give me enough of a buffer to give me funds if I need them for a three year span. I'm rounding the 27 months up to three years just for simplicity. But making it through 27 months to minimize your risk, well, it's less important in your 30s, your 40s, and your early 50s. When I'm about five to 10 years out from retirement of actually pulling out funds, then I want to ensure that I have enough in my fixed income assets to weather a three year storm. I'll need that much to recover from a potential recession without selling any of my growth stock during the dip. If I review my expenses and I know that I need 35,000 a year, then over three years, that's gonna be $105,000 that I would want in my fixed income assets for potential liquidity. And if I have $500,000 in my total portfolio, where I'd have 105,000 in bonds or fixed income assets, it would be 21% bonds and 79% stock. But that's if I had the intention of selling my fixed income assets as needed. But if you do invest in bond ETFs, they often pay a monthly dividend that you can subsidize your living expense. However, those dividends are around 3%. And if I had 105,000 invested there, it would give me roughly $262 a month in dividends. But that wouldn't be enough to pay for all my expenses during a bear market. Overall, I would plan to sell some of my fixed income assets over the three year time period as needed. And once the market corrects itself, 
I would then begin to rebalance out my portfolio to have the right fixed income asset mix just as before. This happens to be my approach for how I'm planning my portfolio, but yours may be completely different. Now, some of you out there are extremely savvy with your investments. And I know that many of you would also take the approach where you may leverage dividend stock to give you added cash flow to make up for your fixed income assets. And that would be a fantastic approach as well. In going through these examples, I just wanna show you how I'm approaching the problem and I'm working backwards to the solution. So in going back to the original question of what is the perfect investment strategy and portfolio? Well, I think you've probably all come to the same conclusion as me. There is none. But if you take the time to create an investment strategy, any strategy, then you'll probably do just fine. Each person needs to take into account their own situation, their appetite for risk, what they have for time horizon to retirement, and how much they have invested versus their total expenses. The worst thing that you could do is not have any strategy at all. Because having no strategy will meet low expectations every time. And as I mentioned earlier, here's a listing of ETF and offered mutual funds by broker that provides a total US market index, international large cap index, and bond funds. I hope that you find value in this chart, and I'll have a link below with a spreadsheet that has these so that you can do your own quick research. That concludes my video on investment strategies and portfolios. Thanks so much for watching.